Okay, so we'll move on a bit. So I've spoken a lot about methylation um, and this reaction that is occurring a billion times every two seconds throughout your brain and body. It makes neurotransmitters, makes phospholipids, activates omega-3s, which only work when they become phosphorylated in the brain. Um, they control genetic expression and repair, detoxify many things, including heavy metals. Mercury is detoxified by methylation. Histamine is detoxified by methylation. Um, sorry, that uh, yes, too, too much homocysteine is what you measure in the blood that means you are not doing methylation properly causes neuronal degeneration and brain shrinkage, depression, memory loss, worse school performance. So the essence is we eat methionine, amino acid, from food, and it turns into homocysteine. And um, then uh, homocysteine wants to turn into S-adenosylmethionine, which does methylation. Uh, SAM-E, as it's known, is a very effective antidepressant. And it works. The evidence is clear. And because it works, it's banned. Because of the Medicines Act, which says if something actually treats a disease, then it's a medicine. If it's a medicine and needs a license, if it already exists, you can't patent it. So there's no means to spend all the money. So it vanishes down the gap. But SAMI is a very effective antidepressant. Now, what happens is, if you've got a block in the folate cycle, you don't have enough folate or B2, uh, you can't complete this process. And that depends on an en enzyme called the MTHFR enzyme, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme. And uh, it's hard. I know uh, I asked one of my students for their exams, how do you remember the, the enzyme? He says, I just call it the motherfucker enzyme, MTHFR. And then you go, okay, okay, that's quite good, actually. And uh, we have genes that make enzymes, genes that are the code for how to put the amino acids together to make the protein that is the enzyme. And 10% uh, of people in this room will have the MTHFR677TT polymorphism, variation of gene, which means you're not so good at making that, which means you need more of those nutrients. So some of these kids with ASD or people with schizophrenia, etc., have got a genetic wobble that means they're more prone to a problem, in this case with methylation, unless they get more vitamins. We're not all the same. Um, if you lack B12, this is methionine synthase, you can't do this part of the cycle. And if you lack B6, there's a sort of, um, you can make from homocysteine glutathione, which is also made from N-acetylcysteine. So if you have enough N-acetylcysteine or enough glutathione, you push the homocysteine towards methylation. So there's an antioxidant support, and that depends upon B6. There is another process of turning homocysteine into uh, SAMI, which is only done in the liver. Everything else is done in every single cell in the body, but only in the liver, using trimethylglycine and zinc, can you uh, do this. So if you have those block, up goes your homocysteine, down goes your uh, methylation. That is why homocysteine, and by the way, I don't know if this works in, in, in Denmark as well as in England, but it's the major driver of Alzheimer's. And when I'm teaching the public, and they're struggling already with the cognition, and they can't remember what it is, I say, just think of gay chapel. Okay? Homo cysteine. Yeah? That's what you have to ask the doctor for. You know? And it just helps. You know? So... Um, above a score of 11.3, you have accelerated brain shrinkage. So I'm 62, and the average person at my age has a level of 12 for homocysteine. So the average person my age already has accelerated brain shrinkage. Um, my level is 6. So there's a number of nutrients that are required for methylation. If you measure homocysteine, you know you're not doing methylation. 
you don't know what it is that's getting in the way. Are you folate deficient or B12? You don't know what it is, but you know that you're not doing methylation. It's a functional test, like HbA1c, glycosylated hemoglobin. If that's raised, you know you've got a problem. Uh, there are different forms. Folic acid does work. Folic acid is synthetic and cheap and stable, and it works. But there's a few people who aren't very good at turning it into something called MTHF, which is what you want. So there is a, a lot of the newer homocysteine lowering formulas are using this. I'll show you in a minute. B12. There are different forms of B12. I like methyl B12. Uh, B6, B2, B3, zinc, trimethylglycine, and N-acetylcysteine. This combination would be the most effective for bringing homocysteine down fast. What is an optimum level of homocysteine below 7 is the lowest risk of coronary artery disease. Uh, below 7 is the greatest risk of minimizing chromosomal damage, protecting DNA, hence slower aging. Below 7 means the greatest psychological function. Above 9.5, accelerated brain shrinkage, but clearly above 11.3. So, um, so how do you lower your homocysteine? You eat more greens, more seeds, more nuts, more beans, high in folate. Um, so you know that these are the foods... Um, lentils, seeds, chickpeas, beans, orange juice, peanuts, greens, spinach, lettuce, broccoli, avocado, you know, etc. So you need to eat all of this, or all of this, or all of this, or all of this, as an example. Um, so think about it. Yesterday, what did you eat yesterday? Okay. Um, you would need to be eating the equivalent of any one of these to achieve the basic level of 400 microgram of folate. Your nutritionists, you know, your diet is amazing. So honestly, if you think about what you ate yesterday, raise your hand if you're absolutely confident that you will have eaten enough to you know, achieve this yesterday. How many? Okay. Okay. So we have a... It's a very positive third of the room and a little bit hesitant half of the room. And we are nutritionists, okay? Um, here's a question. Uh, this is a study that gave people um, either an amount of broccoli that provided, uh, let's say, I can't remember what the dose is, 400 microgram of fo fo folate food, or... Um, uh, they call it food state, where you feed a yeast folate so it gets incorporated into a food matrix, or a supplement of the cheapest folic acid. So it's basically supplement or food. Which do you think works better? Same dose in lowering the homocysteine. Food or supplement? Okay, you have for food. All right. Um, this was the government in England Food Standards Agency. 200 mic microgram food folate in spinach or yeast with synthetic folic, folic acid supplements. Um, the folate in spinach was the least bioavailable, followed by the yeast. Um, and the supplement was the most effective, lowering homocysteine 1.7 times more than the food folate. Just thought I would tell you that, you know? Of course, we all want to go food first. Um, but it's not exactly how you are being told. Um, so here we have the study. Here we have um, folic acid in legumes, dietary folate, or in supplements, the folic acid has to ultimately be turned into 5-methyl... Um, tetrahydrofolate. That's what works. And that 5 actually means 5 methyl groups. And that's what we want, methyl groups. And some people have a block here. Uh, MTHF polymorphisms affect 1 in 4 people, possibly reducing MTHF production to 30%. And um, so this is a study giving folic acid versus methyl tetrahydrofolate. 
which a few years ago, two companies managed to produce a form. One is attached to calcium, and the other one is attached to, I think, glucosamine. Uh, met, I forget what their names are exactly. They're commercial names, but there's been a big push on it because they got a patent, you know, and they can sell it for more. So, and we're we're part of that because we've read all the stories until we stand and go, oh no no, folic acid is really bad. You've got to use MTHF, and part of that is exaggerated. You know, it's true, but it's this study showed that the homocysteine was 14.6 percent on the on the um, versus 9.3 percent lower. Um, so the MTHF was more effective, but not massively more effective. And will be very helpful in some who have that genetic polymorphism, but not in others. Uh, so don't throw out folic acid. Um, I, I have a supplement. I use MTHF specifically because it's the best to lower homocysteine. But I don't think every multivitamin with folic acid should necessarily change. It's like three times the money, you know. Um, so eat more fish, eggs, high in B12 and methyl nutrients. This is a study. Uh, two, two in five people over 61 in the, US, in the UK have insufficient B12 in their blood. Two in five. And uh, here is a study which looked at the lowest dose of B12 required to correct deficiency. B12, you can measure serum B12, blood B12. It's reasonable. Um, somewhat better is to measure the excretion of what's called methylmalonic acid. But the absolute best is to measure what's called THC, transholocobalamin. That is the best B12 measure of all and is the active B12 that you have got. But methylmalonic acid is a pretty good test. And only doses of 647 to 1,000 microgram of B12 were associated with 80 to 90% uh, normalization. RDA, two microgram or two and a half microgram. So you need, you know, 250 times the RDA of B12 to normalize deficiency in people who are deficient. Why? Malabsorption of B12. I'll talk about that in a minute. Cut back on coffee. Uh, here's a study. Well, let's take this one. Across the border, a Netherlands showed that two cups of regular coffee increased homocysteine by 11% after four hours. So coffee raises homocysteine. So if you're guzzling six coffees a day, there's a very good chance your homocysteine will be raised. Um, limit alcohol. Small amount of alcohol, no problem. There are a lot of diseases, dementia, heart disease, where light drinkers have a lower risk than abstainers. Uh, reduce stress, stop smoking. And then the most potent way to quickly lower homocysteine is by supplementing. This level here is what I have every day in a multivitamin. So I met a man in South Africa, and he came up to me. This was about 10 years ago. And uh, he was 59. He said, I feel brain dead. I keep losing my car in the multi-story car park. And sex, I don't even know what it is, you know. And uh, I measured his homocysteine. It was 107. Uh, probably had a genetic polymorphism. You see, the thing is, you do a DNA test. And they go, oh, yes, you've got methylation weakness. Which is okay. But at the end of the day... You don't know unless you measure homocysteine. If you measure homocysteine, you know that this person is having a problem methylating. So in a way, DNA gives you a sort of probability. But if you, were, if you had a DNA weakness, but you were taking B vitamins, it's not a weakness anymore. But the homocysteine shows that you have a methylation problem. He probably had a genetic weakness. Anyway, I told him, eat more greens, eat more beans, take this. Above 15 was three a day. I want to get to these high levels, 1,000 microgram B12. And uh, six months later, his homocysteine has dropped to nine, right? 107 down to nine. And he said, I can't believe it. My, my mind is sharper than I ever remember in my life. I'm waking up completely alert. I have so much energy. Now I'm going running because I've got all this energy. And uh, then he wanted to tell me about his new young girlfriend. I didn't want to go there. So um, 
you know, that's... It doesn't take long. I mean, literally two or three weeks to bring a homocysteine down. And you can't predict who's got the problem. So it's a test I use a lot. Here is a study, um, and it gave people with high homocysteine folate alone, 17.3% reduction, B12 alone, 18.7%, folate plus B12, 58%, folate B12 and B6, 60%. So it's a synergy effect. Um, yeah, so I showed you this earlier, the phospholipids, like phosphatidylcholine, and I think we had this slide already. Um, yeah, so we had that. Uh, yeah, so this is interesting. In a study, pregnant women were given extra choline, uh, two different doses. Their infants were tested for speed of processing information and their memory from the age of 4 to 13 months. The higher dose produced better measures of cognitive ability compared to the lower dose. Choline is going to become an essential nutrient with an RDA. And what I found interesting, where, where I live in Wales, um, they found a 40,000-year-old Homo sapiens. Uh, it was called the Red Woman. Uh, the bones were dyed red, and there was a necklace, and they thought it was a woman. It turns out actually it was a man. So they had transgender even back then, you know. Um, and there were two handfuls of periwinkle shells and shell necklace. And it turned out that 20% of the diet of this 40,000-year-old Homo sapiens was seafood. Now, if you think about that, these, these people will have been expending probably three times the calories that we do all day long, outdoors, walking, hunting, collecting fish, et cetera, et cetera. But even, you know, two times the calories would mean that 40% of our diet would have to be marine food, seafood, to get the level of phospholipids and omega-3s and B12 and all those other things. You know, I think that's what made us Homo sapiens, was the very rich... We were eating the fuite del mar. We were going along the estuaries and collecting shells and fish and crabs. And, you know, it's the easiest possible food supply. Plus, you know, land stuff, fruits, etc. And uh, I think that's actually what made us human. And my chauffeur, Z, as we were driving here, uh, was singing to me um, that song about Molly Malone. Yeah, about the, how does it go? In the streets? In the streets of the city. I first set eyes on dear Molly Malone. On her. Yeah, singing cockles, muscles, alive, alive, ho. So just like, you know, you Danish here on the water, you know, this is actually what our diet was along the water's edge. And 10,000 years ago, we become land-based. And um, with this declining IQ and declining brain size and increasing mental health and increasing population and lack of fish in the ocean and increased pollution, you know, we don't have a chance unless we have got to move into... We're hunter-gatherers in the sea. We used to be hunter-gatherers on the land, then we became agriculturalists on the land. We need to become marine agriculturalists. Our coasts will need to be growing seafood and seaweed at a massive scale. In Japan, they're starting to do this. They're putting in artificial reef structures in the estuaries. They're planting sea grasses. They're bringing back the mussels and the periwinkles and the crabs and the snappers. And they're farming their coast in a way and what we, uh, there's a very wonderful Netflix uh, film called Kiss the Ground, uh, really about the importance of topsoil, you know, and also how it captures carbon. But nothing captures carbon better than shellfish. So uh, we have to regenerate, if you like, the topsoil and the whole uh, marine food base in the oceans, and it also will capture carbon and reverse the global warming situation. Every other breath you take, the oxygen comes from the ocean, from organisms in the ocean 
that consume carbon dioxide and give off oxygen and use the carbon to make their structure. Um, yeah, there's a... Okay. Okay, 10 minutes. Yeah, okay, it's fine, I think we're doing good. Um, so, phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylserine, uh, phosphatidyl dimethyl ethanolamine, DMAE, these are all different phospholipids. They contain methyl groups. When you eat an egg, you're getting phosphatidylcholine, which has, I think, four methyl groups. Um, and it turns into trimethylglycine. Uh, when you grow sugar beet, uh, it has uh, trimethylglycine, it's called betaine, betaine hydrochloride, stomach acid. The hydrochloride bit is uh, added on by a zinc-dependent enzyme. So the sugar beet is rich in trimethylglycine, three methyl groups. Uh, we uh, extract the sugar and make ourselves fat and sick, and then the animals get to eat all the good stuff, the TMG, uh, which then lowers homocysteine, donates a methyl group, which becomes these phospholipids or helps to make SAMe. Um, and then we have DMG, glycine, serine, phosphatidyl, serine, magnesiums involved, B6, etc. So there's a whole network, but we need phospholipids. They're called semi-essential because you can make them, but we don't make enough. And that's why you need more. Even niacin, we make niacin in the body, but we don't make enough. So I think that choline will be classified as an essential nutrient uh, in the next few years. So here you see the picture of it. Um, this is the DHA, all the stringy bits. These are the phospholipids, like phosphatidylcholine and uh, uh, phosphatidylserine. This is cholesterol. This is what a neuron is made of. That's why if you lower cholesterol too much, you get foggy brain. Your memory doesn't work. You need cholesterol in the brain. Lack of phosphatidylcholine DHA is associated with Alzheimer's disease. Synthesis requires methylation. High homocysteine might reduce incorporation of omega-3 into phosphatidylcholine and its delivery into the brain. So you need them both. So if you're vegan, lecithin is a source of phosphatidylcholine. We have lecithin, capsules, granules. Eat root vegetables high in TMG. Eat eggs six a week, preferably free-range, organic, high omega-3. I supplement something called brain food, which gives the phospholipids, but for a pregnant woman, I would say have a spoonful of lecithin granules or a couple of um, lecithin capsules, 1,200 milligram. During pregnancy, good supply of choline, good supply of DHA. Don't get pregnant until your homocysteine is below 7. A 20-year-old woman with a homocysteine of 20 has more risk of a child with a birth defect than a 40-year-old woman with a homocysteine of 7. It's not a function of age, it's a function of methylation. And by the way, to give you an example of that, one of the risk factors for dying from COVID-19 is age. You've seen the graphs. The older you are, the greater your risk. In one recent study in an intensive care unit, um, where almost all their critical uh, patients were low in vitamin C, um, those who died were much lower with half of them having a level below the scurvy level. But because they had both their age and their vitamin C level, they could ask, is age a predictor of mortality if we take into account the confounding factor of vitamin C? And when they did that, age was no longer a predictor of mortality of COVID-19. What is a predictor of mortality is their vitamin C level. And the older you are, the more vitamin C you need. And consequently, you're more likely to be deficient. You see the point? It's actually vitamin C, not age. Now, that was a very small study, because it's a very small number of people. But it makes a principle. So, one way or another, we need to get a lot of phospholipids, whether it's diet or supplements or whatever. So yeah, pregnant woman, I say, get your homocysteine below seven, eat a good diet, have enough omegas, have enough phospholipids, and then you get a super healthy baby. So um, Alzheimer's, first of all, 62% of dementia, when you are losing your memory, 
um, and they may do a test. Uh, and that's normally what happens is someone is not diagnosed until their partner says, do you know, my husband called me the wrong name. I'm really worried, you know. It happens very late in the process. And if the memory is bad, uh, it's called mild cognitive impairment. And if it's very bad, it's called dementia. So depending on the score on the questionnaire. Alzheimer's is only diagnosable on a brain scan. And um, it once 62% of dementia is Alzheimer's. 17% is vascular dementia, which has very much the same cause. And then we have things like Lewy body dementia, which is a bit unknown exactly what to do. So you define dementia by the loss of four cognitive functions and um, a particular kind of brain scan. And this particular kind of brain scan um, was developed by the man that I work with, Professor David Smith at Oxford University, which scans the medial temporal lobe, a very, very central area of the brain. And actually, in a, this is a control, age 66, no pathology. Got a nice and thick, you know, dense medial temporal lobe, uh, while here there's this gap. And uh, that's actually the scan that's used to diagnose Alzheimer's, now used all over the world. In those areas of the brain, you find plaques <coughs> called amyloid plaques. And you find these neurofibrillary tangles called tau. The process of degeneration happens over 50 years. So if you could scan people at the age of 50, very, very sensitively, you could predict um, who's heading in that direction. But there may be no obvious symptoms for another 30 years. And uh, usually by the time someone is diagnosed with cognitive impairment, there's five years before they're in a serious state of dementia, and maybe another five years before they die. So in normal aging, like post-70, you do get a shrinkage of the brain about half a percent a year, but no loss of cognitive function on tests. In mild cognitive impairment, it's about a 1% loss a year. In Alzheimer's, it's 2.5% loss. So it's this increased rate of brain shrinkage. Here, again from Oxford University, we have two people, a control who has a homocysteine 7.8. They have an MRI brain scan repeated after six months with one scan put over the other. There's no loss of brain matter. This is an Alzheimer's disease patient, same age, homocysteine 13.1. What you're seeing here are the brain cells that have died in that um, six-month period in the central medial temporal lobe. You don't get that back. That's the point. You know, we know we can reverse type 2 diabetes. This essentially is not reversible. 55% um, of the risk for Alzheimer's is non-genetic modifiable factors. Only 1% of Alzheimer's is caused by genes. And that's well established. One in a hundred, uh, it's caused by genes. You can have genes that increase your probability, but only if you smoke or exercise or whatever, which is this chunk here. But actual caused by genes is 1%. This is a massive study from the National Institute of Health in America, which attributes 22% of the risk of Alzheimer's to homocysteine. 22% to a lack of fish and omega-3, 31% to smoking, 32% to lack of exercise, and 24% to lack of education. These two are very easy to change. So uh, going back um, five years ago when we really started a big project on this, we could say that 30% of people have a high homocysteine. It accounts for 22% of the risk of Alzheimer's. It's ease of changing, easy. Evidence for an effect is strong. Um, you know, let's go down, I don't know, midlife smoking, prevalence 20%. It's 11% of the risk. Ease of changing, moderate, you know. 
uh, evidence that changing weak. You know, that's just sort of where this is at. Uh, we did, I'm trying to remember exactly when this was, 2014. Uh, we started a campaign, which I'm going to do now with vitamin C. We got 100 and I think 13 world experts on Alzheimer's to sign a statement published in a journal that we can reduce uh, by at least a fifth, you know, the cases of Alzheimer's right now. And we had this inserted into a G8 summit. We had a 45-minute discussion on this. Absolutely nothing has been done. This is Professor David Smith. It's time we woke up to the fact that Alzheimer's is a preventable disease, not an inevitable part of aging. The 10p a day vitamin supplement that tackles dementia, so why is the drug industry spending billions? Um, I think very quickly, and you, know, you have these slides, the essence is that neither amyloid protein nor tau related to treatments have worked. And are these the cause or the consequence? Homocysteine in high, is high in the sites of decay. It is itself capable of damaging neurons. When there is an increase in P-tau, there is also an increase in homocysteine. It does not look like amyloid protein drugs are ever going to work. And uh, injecting mice with amyloid protein improves MS-like symptoms acting like anti-inflammatory agents. So actually, this is the opposite of what you would expect. If amyloid and tau are part of an anti-inflammatory response, blocking their formation may not be the solution. So they're part of a response to a, a situation. Drugs have to go through phases of trials, phase three being the clinical trial. RIP means dead, rest in peace. Every single trial has failed. No evidence that existing drugs modify disease, says the then head of the World Health Organization. In terms of a cure or even a treatment that can modify the disease, we are empty handed. Remember I showed the, you this earlier, you know, blood sugar, omegas, phospholipids, homocysteine, B vitamins, antioxidants, etc. Is homocysteine causal? Uh, the mechanisms, it could be it reduces oxidative stress, it could be the demethylation, it could be cerebral vascular damage, it could be the produces NMDA that attacks the brain, it could be that amyloid protein elevation you know, it causes these. There's a number of potential mechanisms by which homocysteine could be a problem. Uh, so, yeah, we've done that. Uh, I want to mention here that what's happening to our aged population, by the age of 65, the average person is on five drug prescriptions. And by 75, you know, this is double. And um, I have a rather interesting father-in-law who started Carnaby Street. You know, have you ever been there? And he was big into the kids' fashion. You know, he invented the Union Jack tea tray, you know, and various other things. And it was all in the swinging 60s and, you know, acid and drugs. And then he became the Grateful Dead tour manager, which is probably not a great idea. And then he kind of went off the deep end uh, with drugs and messed everything up. And then um, uh, found a spiritual path and sort of got himself back together again. And... The other day I got a phone call. Well, actually, what happened was uh, in London at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, which is the only hospital that was using intravenous vitamin C in the first wave of COVID. My wife is having lunch uh, with her girlfriend, and the phone keeps going, and it's her dad, you know. And she thinks, no, this is girl time, you know, just not now, you know. But it's quite persistent. Eventually she said, what's, what's going on? I said, uh, your father has collapsed. It turned out he was just two blocks away. Uh, he's collapsed and the ambulance is there because by law the ambulance has to pick him up to take him across the road to go to the hospital. Right? Anyway, he's in the hospital, he's all wired up, you know, whatever. And uh, I was called up. So I went in to see him and said, Tom, what happened? He said, well, Patrick, the thing is, this restaurant has a very good deal on food for old age pensioners for lunch on a Wednesday. Um, but the booze is very expensive. So I'd had a couple of shots of rum. And I had this old joint, and I'd smoked that. And my knee was really playing up, so I took some coprodamol, you know, codeine. And I went off there, and I hadn't eaten breakfast. 
you know, and I got to the room, I had a whitey, you know. And uh, he told the doctor, and the doctor said, you know, what drugs are you on? He said, I don't take any drugs. I just take the vitamins that my son-in-law gives me. And I have acupuncture. And he said, you're in better nick than I am. What are you taking? I read it. <laughs> but, you know, this is not what's happening for most people. And uh, most people are ending on antacid drugs, you know, omeprazole, the proton pump inhibitor drugs, which stop you making stomach acid. Because when you get older, your stomach acid level drops, and stomach acid has four functions. One, it digests your food. Two, it kills bugs. It's your sanitation department. Three, it absorbs B12. And four, when the acid level goes high enough, it shuts the valve at the top and the bottom to make an acid bath. So if you don't have enough stomach acid, um, you don't completely digest your food, you don't kill off the bugs, so you end up with dysbiosis, um, and the bugs that you have in your gut now eat the food you haven't digested, so they make gas, and it's got to go up. Um, so you belch, and you haven't shut the valves, so you get some acid going into the esophagus, which causes you heartburn. So all of this is a consequence of a lack of stomach acid. So you're given a drug that stops you making stomach acid. And it makes the heartburn better, but nothing else, really. And what we do is we give stomach acid. We give betaine hydrochloride. The belching stops, the bloating stops, the indigestion stops, everything's good. Taking these drugs, um, uh, taking PPI drugs, you're 44% more likely to develop dementia. Metformin the diabetes drug, increases the risk of B12 and neuropathy. Long-term diuretic use, as in hypertension, increases homocysteine from 18 versus 10. So it's this combination of drugs are leading to this problem. So here we have the study of Professor David Smith, and what he's done is taken a group of people and um, measured their homocysteine and split them into quarters, lowest quarter, highest quarter, Half of them are getting placebo, half are getting B vitamins. Over the next year, they measure the rate of brain shrinkage. The higher was the homocysteine, the greater is the rate of brain shrinkage. Homocysteine predicts the rate of brain shrinkage. Now let's add in the group given the B vitamins. And what you see is for those who have high homocysteine, um, the rate of brain shrinkage after one year is 53% lower after one year. Uh, to give you an example, this is a different kind of scan from the top. So this is the spinal cord. You have a person who's on placebo. Their homocysteine goes up from 22 to 30 in one year. Their brain shrinks by 2.5%. The turquoise is the loss of brain matter in the central area of the brain. Here you have a person on the B vitamins. And um, by the way, I'm very close to the end for our break. And their homocysteine goes down from 24 to 12 their brain shrinks by less than half a percent. There is no visible loss of brain matter, okay? And when you look more closely at the Alzheimer's-related areas of the brain, what you've got here is almost nine times less shrinkage in one year on the B vitamins versus the placebo. Um, this is the Oxford group who not only proved what Alzheimer's was and developed the scan and then found homocysteine high in Alzheimer's brains and then did the double-blind placebo-controlled trials to show that it works, which was published in September 2010. And these people with raised homocysteine at baseline in the B vitamin group uh, were four times more likely to revert to a zero on a clinical dementia rating. So even though I've said you can't reverse it. In truth, their clinical dementia rating improved. Um, last week was a beautiful study came out in the British Medical Journal's Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry. And it was a, meta, a systematic review, a meta-analysis of 243 observational studies, 153 randomized controlled trials. And it concludes that having a high blood homocysteine has level A strong evidence and is the single most promising intervention. 
Notably, homocysteine lowering treatment with B vitamin seems the most promising intervention for Alzheimer's disease prevention. Having a regular blood examination of homocysteine should be treated with B vitamins and followed with a focus on their cognition. Vitamin C in the diet or supplements might also help. And it had this lovely way of showing that. I, I thought this was really clever. Look at all those studies combined. What it's showing is, you know, this is sort of risk factor across the age range that, you know, poor schooling down here and then you move up here and you have hypertension, you know, stroke, smoking. Uh, this is the homocysteine, diabetes, uh, stress, obesity down here, vitamin C, physical exercise, cognitive uh, ability, weight, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, when you look at this in green being the strongest, you realize that all of these, almost all of these, are just nutritionally related disorders. You know, it's, I think it's a very nice way of kind of showing this effect. Then what happened, and this is the last piece of this interesting puzzle before we stop, is they thought, we didn't give omega-3, but we've got blood samples. Let's measure uh, the effect by splitting people into the third lowest omega-3 in the blood versus the third highest. This is the third lowest. What they found was the people without much omega-3 in the blood had no benefit from the B vitamins. And instead of having that 53% less brain shrinkage, the people with a higher omega-3 in the top third had 73% less brain shrinkage. And this dotted line here represents the normal brain shrinkage with no loss of cognitive function. So what they actually found was having sufficient omega-3s and taking the B vitamins in that large subgroup who have raised homocysteine actually stops any further memory decline at all and even improves memory in some. Um, this is an astonishing thing. And now obviously what needs to be done is an omega-3 plus B vitamin study. And for the last seven years, um, these people, the top in the world, have been trying to get money. And no one's been willing to fund it. You know? um, yeah. Uh, homocysteine is significantly reduced after one year of omega-3 treatment. So there's that interaction. The higher the homocysteine, the lower your phospholipid DHA. Um, DHA itself is good for memory. Uh, this is the this recent review. I think actually didn't take into account fish consumption properly. It's the one weakness. It didn't really do that. But I like this study: 65, 50 to 75 year olds given 2.2 grams of omega-3 for 26 weeks, significant increase in executive functions and behavioral structural changes in white matter integrity and gray matter volume. Normal people, 50 to 75 year old, 26 weeks better function, and you can see it in the brain. Uh, here is a study that's rating healthy diet, and it finds that over 14 years of Finnish study, those who ate the healthiest diet had 88% decreased risk of dementia and 92% decreased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and then just to, this is the key, uh, unfortunately the guy that wanted to know about ketones is sort of not in the room at the right time. Um, that a high-fat, low-carb, ketogenic diet switches on autophagy, the cellular cleanup. It pr provides an alternative fuel for neurons. Epilepsy, a keto diet, reduces the number of fits. Parkinson's, comparing a high-fat versus a low-fat diet, you get a reduction in the number of shakes. In those with mild cognitive impairment, two tablespoons of C8-rich oil which makes ketones fastest, improves cognitive function. Um, let me tell you a little bit about this last study, and then I think we'll be ready for a break. Um, fats are chains of carbon. If it's a long chain, like olive oil, there's 14 carbons. If it's a short chain, it's like butyric acid and goat cheese, is four carbons. If it's between 6, 8, 10, and 12, it's called a medium chain triglyceride. But it's C8, which is caprylic acid, triglyceride, that really makes ketones. So here is a study looking at the increase in ketones in the blood 
on a placebo, the black, on coconut oil, the green, very little difference, on just C10, which is the next best, or pure C8, massively different. So this study I was referring to you gave two tablespoons of pure C8 oil without a ketogenic diet. I always thought that you have to sort of not be running on carbs to get a benefit. But actually, just feeding damaged brains C8 oil, um, what actually happens is you can do a thermal scan of the brain, and uh, red means active, and you can see in Alzheimer's brain that the brain cells aren't firing. And, um, you know, while well, they fire much more in control. And what they did in this study was they gave the C8 oil and they could show that brain cells started um, running on ketones rather than glucose, coming back to life, generating more energy. And neuronal energy translated in this case into uh, you know, improvements in uh, a number of actual measures. So this is the first hint you know, of this. And I just saw that Nestle have released a supplement uh, that contains actually high dose B12 and various things, and um, medium chain triglycerides, based on the same research group, but not C8. C8 is really what you want. Yes, these were all the areas where there were improvement, episodic memory and so on. So I end with a practical, I mean, very, very quickly, and then we stop. So we launched something in the UK called Plan B. And what we did was we built, when, you, when you're diagnosed or, or uh, your doctor thinks there's a problem, often you're sent to a memory clinic where they run a test where you have to you know, do various things that measure the four functions that are the definition of a problem. So what we got permission from the best researchers of those four function tests to digitize them. And we created the first online validated and free cognitive function test a few years ago at foodforthebrain.org. Anyone can do it. Uh, we started to promote it. Uh, we have 350,000 people now have done it. And every year we follow them up. And there's also a questionnaire about eating fish and B vitamins and whole foods and smoking and exercise. So we produce a report that says this is your weakest link. Um, and uh, basically you take the test, if not good, you measure the homocysteine, if you know, above 10 or 11, you take the B vitamins, and then you retest in a year. So we're now tracking all these people. Um, and up your antioxidants, minimize the sugar, eat fish and seeds, keep physically, mentally, socially active, supplement B vitamins, limit coffee, you know, these are the things that can make a difference. Now. I want to tell you at this point, the total spend by the British government since 1998 on Alzheimer's prevention is 186,000 pounds, which is less than our tiny little charity has spent. And the total spend on drug development is about $80 billion, right? And the best drug to date, Solanazub, has produced a 2% reduction in brain shrinkage. I've been showing you 53 to 73%. Um, a tiny difference in three tests compared to a virtual cessation of uh, memory loss function. No clinical dementia rating versus 30% more reverting to normal. Um, and one of the big pharma guys came up to Professor David Smith and said, if this was patentable, we're talking about a double figure billion dollar a year drug tomorrow. No question. But it's not. So they want to kill it. And that's what's happening. Um, and I think we'll stop at that point. All right. <clears throat>